Welcome to Excerpts from the Open Forum. On this program, we'll hear Mr. Harold Camping answering pre-recorded questions regarding issues from the Bible. Here's our first question. Yes, I was wondering if you could clarify yesterday what the requirements are for uh, salvation. Uh, and uh, I'll take my answer off the air. I, I'm sure. I'm sorry. You're asking me to clarify which? Well, just basically, for instance, yesterday you mentioned that uh, a person must be selected to be saved and then hear the Word of God. And um, I'm just kind of curious whether or not, uh, in conjunction with that, if, if that's accurate or just believing in Christ as your Savior. Well, you, you see, yes, I'll, I'll be glad to speak to that for a moment. You know, here, let's go right back to the beginning. When our first parents, Adam and Eve, rebelled against God, we were in their loins. Uh, uh, Eve is spoken of as the mother of all living. Uh, we all come from Adam, who she was married to. And so when they sinned, uh, the whole human race became infected with sin. That means that beginning with Adam and Eve and including every one of their progeny, whoever they would uh, would be, uh, children or grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren, uh, right down to the last individual who ever came to life on this earth, they would be under the wrath of God because uh, they uh, would have this desire to sin. They were in, totally infected by sin. And uh, therefore, uh, they were under the a penalty because the wages of sin is death. However, God, for his own purposes, chose, and, and remember, God is God. He knows the end from the beginning. Already before he ever created man, he already knew every human being that would ever come to life throughout the more than 13,000 years of the earth's existence that, that would develop. Uh, he knew everyone, billions upon billions of people. He knew each one. And out of that tremendous mass of mankind, he chose certain ones to become saved. And he insists, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. He didn't answer to anybody. He chose whom he desired. And he indicated very clearly in the Bible in a number of places, he is not a respecter of persons. No, uh, no nation, no class of people, no uh, sex, no, uh, uh, no uh, kind of people had any advantage over any other. He simply chose as he wished to choose. Now, once he chose these, he gave them these individuals that he had chosen, and nobody knows who they are except God, he gave them to the Lord Jesus. We read in John 6, verse 37, where Jesus said, All that the Father giveth me will come to me. But when he gave them to the Lord Jesus, uh, there was a condition with it. In other words, the condition was, that these individuals had to have their sins paid for. They were, they were in rebellion against God, as every human being is by nature. Uh, they uh, therefore were under the, the curse of God. They had to make payment for their sins. And so it required that Jesus take upon himself the sins of, of each and every one of these that God had chosen to become saved uh, and be found guilty for those sins and, and then endure the wrath of God, the punishment, in equal measure to that which would have been experienced by these millions of people that, uh, that were uh, chosen to become saved. So it was an enormous punishment that Christ had to endure. Now, therefore, now that their sins had been paid for, now God could forgive these individuals. These individuals still don't know who they are. And then at an appropriate time, 
uh, only known only to God, as these individuals who were chosen by him were under the hearing of the Word of God or were reading the Word of God, the Bible, because that is the environment when, in which God actually applies this salvation to their life, they became a new creature. That is a m- tremendous miracle happened in their life in that they received a brand new resurrected soul in which they had been given eternal life and in which they would never want to sin again. And that is what salvation is. Now, who are these? We don't know till we become saved. And then when we do become saved, when we do find that we have an intense desire to do the will of God, and then we search the Bible, how is it that I became saved? Ah, it's because God elected me. And he inclined my heart, and he made me a new creature. He did the work, um, the miracle of giving me a brand new resurrected soul. And that is why now I have a real desire to be obedient to him. So I have to give him all the praise and the glory. This is summed up, incidentally, in in, 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 uh, somewhat, well, in a number of places, but in Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 3, Ephesians chapter 1, blessed, verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ, according as he hath chosen us, that is, he's speaking about those who were chosen by God to become saved, according as he hath chosen us, in him, that is, in Christ, that is, Christ had to pay for our sins in order that we could belong to him. Uh, And he chose us before the foundation of the world, that is, before God had created a single human being. This whole plan was already worked out in minute detail, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, in order to be holy and without blame, means that he had to choose us, he had to pay for our sins, and he had to uh, do the miracle of making us a new creature in Christ, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, this, this is a tremendous encouragement to any unsaved person. Because uh, if I'm still unsaved, I could just as well be someone who has been chosen by God to become saved as, as anyone else. Uh, nobody's got the inside track. I could just as well be one of those. Uh, and, and so that gives me hope. And particularly since I know God is not a respecter of persons. And more than that, the Bible says Christ came for sinners. Ah, now I fit the... the I, I, if I'm still not saved, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm in rebellion against God by nature. I know that I want my own way. Uh, so I qualify. I am a sinner. And I could be one of those who are chosen. All right, now, what is the environment in which he saves the hearing of the Bible. Faith cometh by hearing. We read in Romans 10, verse 17, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And so I am going to be in the Word of God as much as possible. And, frankly, I'm learning as I read the Bible and ponder it and pray for wisdom, I'm learning more and more about God and His holiness about Christ's salvation plan. I'm learning more and more about how dreadful my sins are. But I'm also learning about the mercy of God. Oh, my, as I read, I I find again and again the Bible speaks about how God is merciful. And he has given me the privilege, as every unsaved person has that privilege, to plead with God for his mercy. Now, that doesn't mean that that guarantees you're going to become saved, but it certainly does mean that you can know that 
I can tell God about my desire. Oh, God, have mercy, have mercy. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve salvation at all. And oh, But, oh, Lord, have mercy. Could it be that I, too, might become might be one of God's elect. I, I know I just have to wait uh, on God to know. And then at the same time, I can keep in mind a verse like we read in Lamentations chapter 3. That's a little book in the Old Testament. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 26. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 26. It is good that a man should both hope... Oh, what hope for? Hope for that salvation that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. That is what, that's where I, I just have to wait upon God. In the meanwhile, I'm going to keep reading the Bible. I'm going to be praying that I might become more and more faithful to the Word of God. And, and maybe, maybe, maybe God in His mercy will save me too. I have the encouragement, enormous encouragement, uh, uh, not only that I could be one of God's elect, and I do qualify as a sinner, uh, uh, and he's not a respecter of persons, but also I have the encouragement that God is saving a great multitude today, today. We read this in Revelation 7. Verse 9, I saw a great multitude which no man could number, robed with white robes. And when the question was asked, who are these robed with white robes, which is a figure of uh, pointing to the fact that they had, they represent those who had become saved. And the answer came, these are those who come out of great tribulation. Oh, great tribulation. That's where we are right now in God's timeline. That is the last big event before the return of Christ. We're in that time of great tribulation. That means that right now there's a great multitude which God is saving. And my, uh, I could just as well be one of these as anybody else. And so uh, I'm going to keep reading the Bible and I'm going to keep patiently waiting upon God. And under no circumstance am I going to make any demands on God. Now, when are you going to get me saved? Because I know I don't deserve it. I know I don't deserve it. But maybe, maybe, maybe God will have mercy on me too. And that is the biggest question that every human faces today. How can I become saved? And uh, and, uh, it's so wonderful that we can answer it knowing that indeed God is saving a great number, even though that he is not saving anyone uh, uh, through the churches. That era has come to an end. But God's salvation program? No. It is in full swing today. There's a great harvest of souls that will be coming in. You are listening to excerpts from the Open Forum on Family Radio. Mr. Harold Camping is answering pre-recorded questions about the Bible. If you'd like to hear more of Mr. Camping's teaching, you can hear and even download open forum broadcasts, Bible studies, and more. Just go to familyradio.com and click on Audio Archives. Let's continue now with another question. Yes, Brother Camping? Yes. Yes, uh, 2 Kings 22, verse 8. 2 Kings 22, verse 8. And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. Is that the passage? Yes. Yeah. My, my, my question is, do you think or do you feel that that may be the first um, uh, comment on the written Bible? Oh, no, no, no. This is not the first comment. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, indicating the spiritual apostasy 
of Israel of that day, that uh, that uh, the Bible, uh, uh, a record of the Bible that had already been written was not even available. And finally, as they were repairing the temple, this was in the reign of Josiah, they found this copy and uh, uh, how terrible the situation was. Although it's just it's very parallel to the way it is in local congregations today. They have the Bible, but they're not reading the whole Bible. And if you don't read the whole Bible, it's like we don't have it at all. And so there is a parallel situation. But insofar as uh, as uh, writing the Bible, in fact, it's in these days that God gives us a very, very plain statement of how the Bible was prepared. If you turn to Jeremiah chapter 36, where we read in Jeremiah 36, where God told Jeremiah in verse 2, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah, and against all the nations from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah even unto this day. Uh, it may be that the house of Judah will uh, hear all the evil which I purpose. And God goes on to describe how he has given us his word. He dictated it to Jeremiah. Jeremiah spoke it. And his uh, secretary, Baruch, wrote it down. And we have it now in our in our Bible. Jeremiah would be the actual first Bible then. No, the, it, the Bible began really with, with Moses. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, uh, most of Deuteronomy, and that was the beginning of the written word, as near as we know. And that happened, of course, uh, hundreds of years, hundreds of years before Jeremiah. Good evening. How are you doing, Brother Kevin? Very well, thank you. Uh, I have two questions. In the Old Testament, it says if we work on Sunday, we should be put to death. Is that correct? No, it doesn't say that. It says if we worked on Saturday, that was the, the Saturday Sabbath, they were to be put to death because that was a picture of those who are trying to get saved by their own good works, by them mm -hmm. accepting Christ or whatever. But okay. uh, there is no law like that concerning the Sunday Sabbath, but the Bible does indicate that it is God's desire that we, that we uh, use Sunday altogether as a day for pleasing God, uh, doing okay. God's work, and that does not include painting my house and going to the job to earn a living and all of those things uh, that has to do with with our growing in grace, reading the Bible, and, and then also sharing the Bible with others. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question? Yes. Um, in Genesis, when God created the heavens, earth, and man, and creatures, he, is it true, does it say he made a mistake and destroyed everything and saved Noah? Is that correct, or am I wrong? Well, he did not make a mistake. The Bible says he God repented that he had created man. Now, uh, you, you re actually the way God the Bible uses the word repent, we repent of sin, and God did not do sin. What God is uh, is saying there, he's using language that we would use that he was sorry that he had made man, uh, because man is so rebellious. You see, there is no joy. No joy for God that he has to bring judgment on the unsaved of the world. God speaks of places where he weeps. Uh, he weeps. Jesus, for example, wept over Jerusalem because it was a picture of the local congregations that are under the wrath of God. And, uh, and God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And, and uh, yet uh, he made man because uh, uh, this is the way he demonstrates his love as he saves some uh, and as he is uh, 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 bringing them into eternal life 
to be utilized forever and more in eternity future for whatever God had a plan for them. We do have callers all over the world who, or listeners all over the world who do trust the Bible, who do uh, uh, listen to family radio where we encourage them to trust the Bible. And of course, only God can give them that real implicit trust that this is God's Word. But we have a listener in Uganda. Uganda, that's a country in Africa, who's asking a question. And his question has to do with a, a passage in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, as opposed to, as compared with a passage in Daniel 9, verse 26. Uh, he's wondering if they are talking about the same thing. Well, they aren't talking about the same thing, although they're talking about something very, very similar. Let's look at that for a moment. In Second Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, it is speaking about the end of the world, uh, where we presently are in the time of great tribulation, when God has abandoned the local congregations, and, uh, and indicating that the wicked one, that is Satan, shall be revealed, whom the Lord, I'm reading now from verse 8 of Second Thessalonians 2, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is against the working of Satan, that is Christ, the Holy Spirit is coming, uh, against the working of Satan with all uh, Satan works with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. In other words, this is speaking about Satan coming uh, in an effort to destroy the body of believers and destroy, uh, try to destroy the work that Christ has come. He came you know, to uh, build his kingdom. And the kingdom consists of all those who are true believers. Now, in uh, Daniel chapter 9, their God is talking not about the coming of Christ at the end of the world. Oh, yes, he does speak about that, but not in verse, not in, uh, verse 26. That's in verse 27. But in verse 26, he says, after three score and two weeks, this is Daniel 9, verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Now, in the case of Second Thessalonians 2, it is talking about the end of the church age, the local congregations that have externally represented the kingdom of God throughout the New Testament era, uh, or most of the New Testament era. And here in uh, Daniel chapter 9, it is talking about uh, the Messiah himself is cut off, and the Messiah who is Christ, and he was cut off at the time of the cross. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, the people who destroyed him were those who should have known better. They were the, uh, the nation of Israel that uh, did not want Christ as their Messiah. They wanted him killed. And that played right into God's hand because Christ had to uh, bear the sins of all those he came to save and uh, become a curse for us. And that included the fact, therefore, that he had to be crucified so that he would be put on display as having become a curse for us. Now, the, there is a similarity, though, uh, in, uh, in the fact that at the end of the nation of Israel, which is in view here in verse 26 of Daniel 9, uh, the apostasy of Israel had become very, very great. Virtually nobody is becoming saved. Everything is in opposition to Christ as the Messiah. And then that followed with the with the uh, great uh, with the uh, church age uh, in D Daniel uh, or in Second Thessalonians two it is talking about the fact that the whole church 
the local congregations are in opposition to God and to Christ. They claim they are serving Christ when actually they're in rebellion against that. And they, in turn, are under the judgment of God. So there is a, at least a similarity, but I, actually these two passages are talking about events that are about 2,000 years apart.